Bernard Riemann was a German mathematician in the 19th century. His PhD advisor was Carl Friedrich Gauss. Amongst his many contributions, he's notable for the Riemann integral, as well as being the first person to rigorously define the integral, the analytic continuation of Euler's zeta function, Riemannian geometry, which was fundamental in Einstein's general theory of relativity, Riemannian surfaces, which made a strong link between topology and complex function theory, and the Riemann hypothesis, which is probably the greatest unsolved conjecture in number theory. Riemann was born to Friedrich Bernard Riemann and Charlotte Abel on September 17, 1826, under the name George Friedrich Bernard Riemann. They lived in Quickborn, a village located in the Gemmeln municipality in Lower Saxony, Germany. Father Riemann was a Lutheran pastor and very poor, so the family lived rather harshly. Often malnourished due to poor diet, the threat of tuberculosis was always staring the family in the face. In fact, Charlotte died when Riemann was 20 years old, and basically all of Riemann's siblings, one brother and four sisters, died at young ages. Only his sister Ida lived till at least middle age. Riemann's parents believed the most important thing they could give their children was a strong education. Aside from a few classes in the local school, Riemann was primarily homeschooled by his father. Age 10, his father hired a local teacher, who we know under the name Schultz, to teach Riemann arithmetic and geometry. Riemann quickly outgrew Schultz, actually beginning to teach the teacher some mathematics. At age 13, Riemann was sent to live with his maternal grandmother in the city of Hanover. The city was about 90 miles from Quickborn, which made trips back to Quickborn very difficult. He was terribly homesick during his time there, and the fact that he was incredibly timid and had a fear of public speaking only strengthened this. During his time at his grandmother's, Riemann attended the Tertia des Lyceums Gynasium, a school for students expected to attend university. He was behind his classmates in most subjects, but he worked very hard and still managed to get good marks. At age 15, Riemann's grandmother died, which forced him to move. He ended up in Lüneburg, attending the Johannium Gynasium, which was 45 miles from Quickborn, making it much easier for him to go home and see his family. Riemann was quite frail, so the trips were rough, but his homesickness was too profound for him to care. At the school Riemann attended, a teacher named Herr Schmalfus noticed Riemann's strong mathematical abilities. He ended up lending Riemann college-level mathematical texts, including works from Euler and Lujan. It is rumored that he read Lujandur's 900-page number theory work, understood in full detail in a six-day period. At age 19, after Father Riemann was able to save up enough money to send him off, Riemann began attending the University of Göttingen. He began attending in the spring of 1846, majoring in theology. Riemann was a devout Lutheran and wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. His deep interest in mathematics led him to attend mathematical lectures, most influential being from Carl Friedrich Gauss. Apparently, after a bit of getting to know Riemann, Gauss recommended that he give up his theological studies to pursue mathematics. After Riemann asked his father if that would be okay, he switched over to mathematics and philosophy. Had his father said no, the progress of mathematics could have been greatly slowed down, as Riemann would have never gone against his father's will. After about a year at Göttingen, Riemann transferred to the University of Berlin to learn from mathematicians who were on the front lines of mathematics at the time. He ended up being taught by people like Carl Jacobi, Lujan Dirichli, and Gotthold Eisenstein. Eisenstein was only three years older than Riemann, so they actually became good friends. But sadly, Eisenstein did not live very long, dying in 1852. Despite the close friendship Eisenstein and Riemann had, the most influence was from Dirichli. Dirichli has very intuitive explanations, very logical analyses of foundational questions, and avoided long computations as much as he could. Riemann ended up adopting the style almost wholly. In the spring of 1849, Riemann decided to go back to Gernigan to work on his PhD under Gauss. He also studied philosophy and theoretical physics, which would become lifelong interests of his. He was fascinated by Wilhelm Weber's physics lectures and actually became an assistant to him for 18 months. 
In December 1851, at age 25, Riemann finally obtained his PhD in mathematics. He could have obtained it sooner, but like Gauss, he was a perfectionist. Thus, he published far less than he probably could have during his career. Gauss, who was notorious for ridiculously high standards, praised Riemann for the work, describing him as having a glorious, fertile originality. Riemann's thesis was on the theory of complex functions, which studied what we now refer to as Riemann surfaces. It introduced topological methods into complex function theory, and built on Cauchy's foundations of complex analysis, as well as Huizu's ideas of branch points of analytic functions. For those curious, a branch point is a point in the complex plane, whose complex argument can be mapped from a single point in the domain to multiple points in the range, a one-to-many relationship. Riemann's thesis was incredibly original, examining geometric properties of analytic functions, conformal mappings, and connectivity of surfaces. This work also introduced an early version of the Dirichlet principle, which is the assumption that the minimizer of a certain energy functional is a solution to Poisson's equation. Riemann, of course, learned this from lectures he attended while in Berlin. But the principle did not actually originate from Dirichlet. People like Gauss and George Green had leveraged this methodology beforehand. Due to how Riemann had presented the Dirichlet principle, Karl Weierstrauss pointed out the issues with its use in his paper. This made people doubt Riemann's methods, though Weierstrauss did firmly believe in Riemann's results. The path to trying to patch up this issue by other mathematicians was actually quite fruitful. People like Alfred Klebsch and Max Noether were able to uncover important algebraic ideas even with non-successful patching. David Hilbert was the one to finally provide a correct form of Dirichlet's principle, which finally closed that rigor gap. Per Gauss's recommendation, Riemann was appointed a post at the University of Gernigan. To become a lecturer, he had to work on a habilitation, which is a postdoctoral thesis. It took him two and a half years to complete and was on the representability of functions by way of trigonometric series. For the postdoctoral events, Riemann had to give a lecture on the work he did. On June 10, 1854, Riemann gave his lecture entitled On the Hypothesis Underlying Geometry. This lecture introduced the world to Riemannian geometry. The first part of the lecture posed the problem of how to define n-dimensional space, leading to the definition of Riemannian space. The second part of the lecture posed deep questions about the relationship of geometry to reality. What is the dimension of real space? What geometry describes real space? Needless to say, the lecture was too far ahead of its time. Of those that attended, only Gauss appreciated the depth of Riemann's thinking. Riemann's insights weren't fully understood until about 60 years later, when in 1915, Einstein introduced the general theory of relativity. After this lecture, Riemann was finally able to teach at the University of Gernigan. Initially, he wasn't too keen on teaching because of how shy he was, but he slowly grew out of this and began to love it. In 1857, Riemann was appointed to professor at the University of Gernigan and was put on a regular salary. He also published a paper titled Theory of Abelian Functions. This is the result of work carried out over several years. He gave a lecture on some of the materials somewhere between 1855 and 1856 to three people, one of which was Dedekind. Dedekind is notable because he ended up publishing material from Riemann's lectures after he died. This paper continued where Riemann's original dissertation left off, like expanding on the theory of Riemann surfaces and their topological properties, examining multi-valued functions as single-valued over a special type of Riemann surface, and solving general inversion problems. Riemann's paper was so good, it actually got Weierstrauss to pull his own paper on the same subject matter out of publication. Riemann had introduced a lot of new things that were richer than what Weierstrauss had attempted to publish. It must be noted that neither Riemann nor Weierstrauss had any proofs in their Abelian papers. The first proof of any of the theorems contained didn't show up until 1883, in a short paper published by Henry Poincar and Emile Picard. In 1859, Dirichlet died. At that time, he had held Gauss's chair of mathematics at the University of Gernigan. So on July 30th, 1859, it was only fitting that Riemann be appointed to the chair. 
He was also elected to the Berlin Academy of Sciences with recommendation from Ernst Kummer, Carl Wilhelm Borjart, and Weierstrauss. Any new elect had to show their most recent research, and Riemann chose his paper on the number of primes less than a given magnitude. This paper explored properties of the zeta function. Riemann expanded Euler's original function of the complex plane, allowing for all values except for 0 and 1 to be used as inputs. This is of course made possible using the functional representation of the zeta function. Besides introducing this functional form, Riemann also proposed the infamous Riemann hypothesis, which states that all non-trivial roots of the zeta function have real part one half. As mentioned, it still has not been proven or disproven, stumping mathematicians to this very day. There were actually no proofs in the paper provided by Riemann. Jacques Hadamard and Charles-Jean de valle poussin ended up proving many of the results later on. In June 1862, Riemann married Elise Koch, a friend of his sister Ida, and they had a daughter later that year. Very soon after having their daughter, the family made their way down to Italy. Riemann had a very bad cold that turned into tuberculosis, so they thought that the warmer climate of Italy would help him get better. Given the poor circumstances Riemann grew up in, he was pretty much always in poor health. Thus, it's believed that his getting tuberculosis shouldn't solely be attributed to his cold, and rather attributed to years with a bad immune system. From this point forward, there was a lot of back and forth traveling between Italy and Gernigan. In the winter of 1862 to 1863, Riemann traveled down to Sicily with his family, and then they traveled through Italy a bit before returning to Gernigan in June 1863. Alas, Riemann's health plummeted soon after arriving back, and about a year later, they made their way back to Italy, living in northern Italy from August 1864 to October 1865. They then made another trek back to Gernigan for the winter of 1865 to 1866. The return was even more short-lived than the last, as Gernigan got caught in a clash between the armies of Hanover and Prussia. Riemann and his family made their final trek down to Seleska, Italy, where Riemann would die on the shores of Lake Maggiore on June 16, 1866, finally succumbing to tuberculosis. Well, there you have it. A very brief history of Bernard Riemann. I've personally spent a lot of time playing around with the Riemann zeta function, so Riemann may be my favorite mathematician from the 19th century. But as I keep researching, well, we'll see if that changes. Hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I will catch you next time.